Thank you very much, and I'm so sorry I'm standing so so high today. I hope that later we will have a chance to communicate. I think that it's uh, more fun that way. But anyway, so I would use this opportunity to talk briefly about the work that uh, I have done. I think I moved to the U.S. almost 10 years now, and um, before that in Japan for 15 years. So I do uh, consider myself a citizen of the world in, in many ways, and I really do believe that America is the best place uh, for people like me. So um, I uh, would like to, to talk about that. So uh, in the beginning when we start, we have, we actually call Y architecture. And within our Y architecture, we have a closet itself called Y laboratory, which we uh, did everything which is non-architecture, anything from objects to research to advertisement and anything else. So I feel like we kind of need to recognize that. So we just changed our name to Y Design, which is really a, a, a cliche name, but it kind of covers what we're trying to do. And so uh, what we have right now, we have buildings, which is uh, what we have been doing, objects, which we do uh, furniture design and installations and things like that. We actually just started our landscape um, design as well within, within the office. And um, we also have ideas, which we do a lot of research and publications and things like that within the office. And in a way, it kind of worries me, it keeps me up at night about all these things that I like to try to do, but I feel like at the end of the day, it all connects to the same pool of ideas that we like to try to do, except that when you put architecture on it, it seems to be, uh, people seem to expect certain things out of it. So I think that's why we kind of changed that. So we have an office, our main office is actually in Los Angeles, which we started almost 10 years ago. We have around maybe 25 people. And at the New York office, we started around two years ago. We have around 10 people there. And we have a small office in Louisville of two people that we, and it's not because of wanting to do more. I mean, it would be great to do more work in Louisville too, but there's something about that city, the energy and things that I kind of feel that I'm going to spend five years of my life in that place. I would rather have a contribution that is not just professional, but also personal. So having an office there allow me to really be involved in the activities and things like that, which we actually do a lot of salon talks, both in LA, New York, and Louisville. So we like to be part of the community that we are in. It's not just about getting a commission even though you need commissions to continue to pay people to work for you, but you know, at the end of the day, it's about the inspiration and the interaction you get from people that you like to meet, and they're using uh, these uh, uh, commissions or projects as a way to really kind of uh, generate the conversations I like to have. So, well, today, uh, I mean, I talk a lot about food and architecture because um, I think that for some reason, uh, architecture has become very difficult thing for people to understand and uh, it kind of get become uh, an esoteric kind of society and I like to try to really bring it back to everyone else and I always feel that you know food have such an intimate relationship to people, fashion have such an intimate relationship to people, how could architecture not have that? At one time people were very strongly uh, opinionated and very passionate about all these things but architecture for some reason become architects or developers or patrons uh, thing that regular people do not get involved in as much. So I, my theory about this is I think that because, you know, for example, let's look at what architecture is today. Back, way back when, uh, Ms. Wanderer was saying that less is more, and then later, you know, Venturi come out in the postmodern period and said less is a bore. <laughs> and then after that, uh, Philip Johnson seemed like, I'm a style whore. <laughs> so in a way, it goes from absolute modern to completely postmodern reductionism, and now it's like, well, whatever it is, whatever goes. So I think in a way, uh, what, what it tells us is that we actually kind of have become self-obsessed with our own expression. We wanted to be artists, but we're not, because we're using other people's money to build our expression. So architects, I think, lost that communication society because we, you know, want to be artists. I want to be uh, self-contained. So I think that uh, at the same time, I think we feel that uh, there's, a, there's a quote by Corbusier, which is really nice, that he said, "Life is always right." 
And I think lives mean a lot to other people. And I, I feel that, in a way, uh, architecture is trying to get back to connecting to life in many ways. For example, uh, green architecture, organic architecture, uh, sustainability is all about life on Earth. It's about sustainability. You also have cases, for example, like all the biomimicry architecture that trying to lead back to what animals and what the, 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 uh, the ecosystem function. You have you know, everything from zoomorphic, biomorphic, you know, and primitive, and, and all of these things. And we all try to get back to life. We, we, we all want to try to get architecture back from a, from a man-made artificial object to something that actually relates to, to, to the system. And for me, I mean, coming from Asia is a little bit of a different uh, perspective. You know, we, we look at things slightly different. You know, I think uh, we always look at architecture is always part of art, part of uh, environment. It's never really become its own thing. And that's kind of part of the thing that's quite important. And one of the things that I was, uh, is my own kind of case studies that I would like to share. You know, as Charles mentioned, I uh, was born in Thailand. I lived in Thailand for a long time before I moved to Japan. So Thailand, um, I don't know whether anyone know, but uh, Thailand is a, a little country over here, which is, this is China over here, this is India. So Thailand is in an area called Indochina, which is between uh, China and India. So in a way, it's like a, a little person uh, uh, between two big people on coach, in, on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> so you can understand how that feels. Right, so you kind of have to squeeze yourself between these two big people. You know, if a person to the left wants to do something, you kind of have to squeeze in. And so Thai culture, in a way, represents that. Someone that has to defend yourself. You have to kind of survive that ride. Japan, on the opposite, is very different. Japan is at the end of the universe, back in the back row by himself, spreading throughout the whole back seat. So Japan, even though it's actually not that bigger country, always have a sense of isolation because of the island country, island mentality that it has. At the same time, no one bothers Japan because the sea around Japan is very difficult to cross to. Even China and Korea try many times to go and invade Japan. It wasn't that easy. So in a way, Japan always has its own independence and has its own self-refinement that is interesting. And my connection to Japan, not only that I studied there for so many years, I also worked for my mentor, which many of you might know, uh, who's actually uh, my mentor, everything of the world. He taught me everything I know. And I was there uh, working closely with him so, for so many years. And people always ask me, uh, because even in Japan, it's quite unique as a system of practice. What does the Ando office feel like? It feels like, uh, like a Zen monastery. It's very quiet, it's very meditative, but it's kind of like that uh, combined with a sweatshop. Because you work, as you know, you work from 8 o'clock until 11 o'clock every day, Sunday, Saturday also. At the same time, there's no talking, there's no telephone, there's not even, a, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a full uh, Zen meditation moment, which I think, uh, uh, can drive for some people crazy, especially foreigners, but I survive. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, the part I want to talk about is that it's so interesting for me personally to look at these two cultures and look at how they form design, they form architecture. And I choose to talk about that through food because I think that food of anything is, you cannot bullshit with food. <laughs> you know, if it's delicious, it's, it's delicious. We talk about that outside, that no matter how much you try to be in, to, to intellectualize food, to try to bring it up from something, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. If it's not good, it's not good. You can bring ideas and intellectualism to it, but it has to taste good. And I think architecture, in a way, should have that kind of function. You should not substitute comfort and space with theories and, uh, you know, kind of notions. So that's something that I kind of would like to talk about. Again, going back to Thailand and Japan. Thailand, I mean, Japanese food is maybe more well known than Thai food. It's all about abstraction. It's about refinement. It's about order and simplicity and, you know, kind of the abstraction. Thai food is almost the opposite. 
Thai food is always about mixing and blending and improvisation and creating something out of nothing. I mean, in a way, it's very funny. Uh, Japanese food is all about obsessed about purity and the flavor, you know, the strength, uh, the clarity of thoughts and things like that. Thai food is all about harmonizing, creating. Uh, Japanese food is one essence come out at one time. Thai food is so many essence, so many tastes coming at the same time, salty, spicy, sweet, all of that combined. So I think that's kind of interesting. For me, I always think that Jap Jap Japanese food represents modern architecture. It's a clarity of thought, it's the it's a it's purity of structure, it's the ideas. You know, I think we all were taught, I mean at least in my generation, we were taught in a modern architecture sense of making. You know, everything has to be about clarity. The idea is the kind of thought, kind of structure, everything kind of defined one by one. But I think that more and more we find ourselves living in a Thai food kind of environment. You know, uh, Japan can do that because Japan is completely zero immigration. It's all Japanese people. You know, they don't like foreigners over there if you have not, never been there. They, they don't know what to do with foreigners because they, they've never have to deal with it. At the same time, we can't ignore it that any cities in the world is now become globalized cities. The diversity, uh, the democratization of opinions and ideas are coming through us big time. And the, the generation of the last generation of, you know, Frank Gehry, Ando, Richard Meyer and so forth, I think we will continue to honor that, but it's going to be very outclassed very fast because there's no one person that can say, oh, I want white, so I'm going to want everything in my museum to be white. Everyone's going to come and say, well, you know, there's a variety of opinions and interests, let's try to see how this works. So what I'm kind of promoting is that the Thai food way of thinking can actually help us a lot, because it will teach us how to really blend the different flavors and different ingredients and different dress and cook something that can be as unique as that. And it's something that is not done easily overnight. It's going to have to be something that process through the interest for varieties and differences. And it's something that, you know, I mean, of all places, America should, should, should honor because that's what it is. But anyway, not only just the way that the food is, the way that people eat in Japan and in Thailand also are very different. In Japan, as you can see, the way of eating normally goes from the, cook, from the raw to the cook. You, you have a sequence of what you eat. And even though food are uh, served in uh, compartmentalized kind of uh, containers, it's like that. Thai food, in a way, is kind of interesting because it's, it's eaten as it was cooked. Um, maybe it's something that comes from India. So, so in a way, you'll be presented with all these, all these dishes in front of you, and then every bite is different. I'm not sure, I mean, I'm sure that everyone has Thai food before, but I hope that you have eaten it the way that we like to eat it. Is that uh, the first bite would be, okay, rice and curry and that sauce. The second bite, you think, okay, well, we have that flavor just last bite. Okay, next bite, I'm going to do this one. So if your meal consists of 20 bites, it's all completely different depending on the variety of how you mix everything together. So it's very painful for me when I take my parents to Western restaurant. They sit in front of a piece of fish and it's like, you mean we have to eat this whole fish by ourselves? This is not fun. And it's really kind of interesting because um, it's not that the food is not bad, except that they miss that variety and the interaction that the diner and the cook have. In a way, it doesn't mean that every bite will be equally good, but it's, it's a very interactive process of allowing the diner to, to determine how that person wants to make a decision in eating it. Which I think that it's quite unique and not a lot of places have done that. So again, I'm talking about that because I think that architecture and design will continue to be a very partic participation-based process. And unless we know how to understand and interact with our audience and our users, we will not understand the, the depth of experience that we can provide for any type of building that we do. And I'm learning it more and more because uh, working with museums and other things, you are you you you're surprised every time at how people want to use the building and how that can actually inform you back as how you should design these buildings. 
And I believe that kind of what is the future of design. Anyway, to continue the thought about food again, I think you know even food also lost contact with people because people were obsessed with eating a lot and eating cheap things and eating a variety of things. So in my search, I, I even when I was in Thailand, I was very obsessed with identities. I was obsessed with what is the right thing for a Thai architect to do, not to copy a copy of a copy of a bad building in America, but really create something that is genuine and fitting with the climate and the culture and the way people use the cities. So I, I look a lot at Chef as uh, my way of identifying because architecture, if you're lucky, you get to do a building maybe once every two years, every three years. Chefs get to cook three times a day. So when you think about the cycle of thinking, you know, we think one time we continue to endure that. Of course, architecture has power because we actually shelter people, we're part of an environment people grow up in. Chefs actually get to think about, a lot about their work in a much more faster pace. So I look a lot at chefs and how they deal with their practice and their materials. So lately, I'm, I've very been obsessed with one chef, who I mean is kind of one of my heroes in the, in the thinking, is this guy, and his name is René Recepi. Uh, uh, he is the chef and owner of a restaurant called Noma in Copenhagen, which is voted the best restaurant in the world for three years. Anyone have eaten there? Just to check. Uh, he's only maybe 33 years old, but uh, uh, René, uh, I think uh, before that, worked uh, for many years under uh, Fred, Ferran Adria, who uh, owned a restaurant called El Bouilly, which is uh, considered the best restaurant in the world for the last 15 years, until he closed the restaurant two years ago. And so, but anyway, so what, what I mean, if, if I may, what Ferran Adria had done is, uh, in a way, I'm sure that everyone watched the movie, uh, The Devil Wear Part Prada. Right. He is the one that dictated the form that we are eating. He invented the form in the vegetables and all of the weird sauces and eyes and all those things. The techniques of food that basically he, he deconstruct how tastes were made and create that taste in a different format. You know, like what we talked to, to, before, he was, he would be cooking uh, uh, a dish called American breakfast, which come in in a soup. It's a soup that tastes like potato, egg, and bacon. So it's, it, in a way, he's playing with food in a way that we might feel it's pathetic, it's not su sustainable. But he drove food to a point that it completely, that you, what you see is not what you're getting. And so in a way, for the, for the last 15 years, he was the master of, of chef for everywhere. So everything we're eating in every little restaurant now in the whole world have something to do with what he invented 10 years ago. Which is really interesting uh, because we can go into even Olive Garden and we'd, just, we'd be surprised that a lot of techniques that they were using in the kitchen today was invented in a very high end restaurant back in the Bass region, I'm sorry, uh, outside in Rosa, outside of Barcelona. In a way, so uh, uh, René Recepi worked with Fernand Madrid for many years and went back to Copenhagen and realized that he really wanted to do something different. After you cook at the temple of, I mean, I didn't find a lot too because, you know, I was also working with a mentor who was very strong in his opinions and his techniques, so I need to kind of find my own identity and something out of it. But what Rene and his partners did was that he decided that his food has to be about regions. He, he put a, man, a manifesto down that he would not use any ingredients that could not be found 50 miles from his restaurant, which is Copenhagen. So, there's no olive oil involved, there's no tomato, there's not a lot of vegetables that came after. So he had to go, really go back and look at the ingredients that, that the Scandinavian area had to offer and really cook something completely unique out of it. He put limitation on himself so that he can make something new. So for example, in this particular case, these are some of the dishes, and he, he put a lot of focus on the sense of place. For example, uh, this, these are the, the root vegetables that are actually being cooked by, by fake soil. But all of this is making from the soil that the root vegetable was grown up in. The same thing with uh, the quail egg that were being steamed using the hay and everything that the quails were growing up in. So this, uh, the other uh, case would, could be, for example, would be interesting like this, is that 
it would be, uh, he's very big in foraging, which is going to the forest and really pick up things. He employed uh, many foragers at his restaurant. So what he did is he gone to the forest and found a beautiful place in the wood. And he asked himself, how could I transfer the sense of being there to a dish that someone had eaten, understand what it is to stand in a sunny day outside of Copenhagen and eat this food. So for example, something like that would be mushrooms that grow under a pine tree that get cooked together with the pine tree, the bark and everything, including the egg of the bird that was growing up in that tree. So it's kind of, I know, it's kind of obsessive and weird, but, <laughs> but it is, it brings regionalism to a different level and it's also very poetic. Whether we actually taste that or not, we don't know, but we believe that there's no other seasonings applied to the food except what happened on that particular place. And I think that, for me, at least, it gave me such a refreshing uh, way of looking at architecture, because way back when, I was very obsessed with identity myself, and I was trying to find a way that when I was in Thailand, this is before in Japan, how do I bring something that meaningful to my own place and to my own culture, at the same time, not stupidly closing my eyes to what's, what's happening around the world and around the universe. I want to be a global citizen that do right for my plays. So because of that, I look at, when I was about uh, to go abroad to study, I look at uh, masters who I admire, and I decided w way back when that I do not want to go to the Western countries because modernism was made in the West. And when we come from a place, I, I, I don't consider America the West because America is not, in a way, because it, modernism wasn't made in your country. You receive modernism, and when you receive modernism into your country, how do you deal with it? Do you have a fancy about it and you don't digest it and become a problem for your culture? Or do you understand, you no know, complex, you are, you are able to really blend this very nicely, harmonizing the modern civilization and technologies with the indigenous way of looking and living and, and, and thinking. And for that reason, I look a lot for Barakan, who's a Mexican artist that, I mean, architect that I completely admire. Uh, uh, Barakan was, as you know, completely, completely, uh, 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 was inspired by Corbusier big time. And really, uh, after spent time in Europe, went back to Mexico and realized, okay, what I need to do is to create something out on my own senses. Looking back at Mexican landscape, like Mexican colors, and create such a great, great uh, uh, way of creating architecture that really contribute back for all of us uh, around the world. Oscar Niemeyer is also another uh, person. I, I feel like uh, Niemeyer is the right man at the right time. You know, he come into his prime when Brazil was a young country, when uh, the whole country needed identity. Again, was amazingly inspired by Corbusier, and actually worked with Corbusier on the first project, and then went on to really kind of bring out a, a great sense of identity through the blending of his love for the work that Corbusier has done, as well as understanding what Brazil needed, and the aspiration of landscape, and the sense of the culture that he could really bring out in his work. And obviously Ando also, who again was heavily inspired by Corbusier. His dog was actually was named Le Corbusier. And, um, but at the same time, look back at his own culture in Japan and really try to bring out the sense of aesthetic that Japanese culture had that had nothing to do with Corbusier, that had nothing to do with Miss Van der Rohe. You know, he created the sense, the design, which is minimalism, but it has that soulful Japanese sense of limits, sense of poverty, which is quite beautiful. And so because of that, you know, I looked at these people that I feel like, well, those are the people that I rely, that I related to, that these are the people that did, did not, were not born in a culture that created modernism, but were able to really take the imported culture, blend it in with what we have locally, and create a unique aspect out of it. So that's kind of what my uh, story is about. So I'm going to go briefly to look at my projects and hopefully we can go quickly to questions. I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go pretty fast. So the first project that uh, we actually started our office uh, is uh, the, the Grand Rapids Art Museum, which is uh, uh, the first uh, uh, art museum in the world to receive the LEED certification. 
And again, I think we, I, I started when we just started office for a year, so we, we have a very short time to do it. And for me, uh, you know, actually I have to admit that it wasn't my idea to, to start a, a sustainable design for a museum. It was something that was given to me by the client. The client was very interested in sustainability. And he said, well, I want it to be the best museum, but I also want it to be the, the most sustainable museum that we can, we can make. So like, oh, wow, that's great. If you're willing to pay for it, that's awesome. Let's do, and so at the same time, I also don't want it to be something that's separate from, from the art aesthetic. I feel like the, the green aspect and the art aspect have to, be the, have to be the same thing. It cannot be something that you cook and then all of a sudden pour some vitamin on. And that, that doesn't work. So, so I was really deeply interested in how we can create a, a design that very thoughtful from the beginning, starting from the site planning of the building, uh, we occupy one block of the city, so we try to create uh, the indoor-outdoor aspect of the museum, natural light and so forth, uh, which many of you know. Uh, this is the, the lobby of the, of the museum and the spaces. And the idea, uh, uh, sorry, it might be a little bit too dark, the idea that I have used, uh, that, that trying to kind of get to uh, understand the, the, the sustainable idea of the museum is I go back to the to, to the essentials, which is the elements. So earth, water, light, fire, and air. So earth is about materials. So using as much as possible local materials and recycled materials. Water, of course, is to try to really recycle and use the water that we have. Air and light is very common to any living beings. Is you want to have natural light, you want, I mean, um, and for lead, as you know, you know, there's a certain percentage of natural light that you want to use for this museum, it's around 78 percent of, of all the spaces have natural light in them, and um, the air is also how you create the sense of space and also light in there. And the other one is fire, which is the energy of for an art museum, which Charles mentioned uh, when I was uh, quoted in the New York Times by saying because I was trying to under people to understand that art museum of all places actually consume a lot of energy. You can't imagine, I mean, I mean, maybe we can ask Charles later or watch your power bill every monthly for this museum. It's insane. You don't want it. Because, because you, you're not only keeping like a refrigerator, you're keeping it exactly at 70 degree or 72 degree, exactly at 50% humidity, 24 seven, whether you're here or not here. And so when you think about that, there's a lot of energy involved in doing that. And of course, the art museums do not want to talk about it because it seemed like a loss and like a lot of ways. So, but at the same time, it's important for people in the society to make investment in that. Like, well, if you're going to spend all this time spending energy uh, preserving the artwork, what is in it that we, that's for us? So I think it's important to, to think about that. So at the same time, when you, when, we, when you design a new museum, you need to think about the energy they use to make sure that you know, it, can, it can justify uh, the consumption. So these are the auditorium, which we use local wood. And so I'm kind of putting some pictures together with the talk. And um, part, of, part of the exhibitions, uh, part of the, the museum, we were asked to do uh, an exhibition on sustainable design. So we call it the four storage boxes. And um, the reason why we call it that, because we actually, the, the whole exhibition was made from salvage material from the construction site. Because um, it's not as an idea in the office, like, well, why don't we use some of the recycled materials and things like that. I do use a lot of concrete in my work because concrete is local materials. You can get most of the materials locally. So, and so we use a formwork uh, of the uh, concrete construction as the boxes. And the concept behind that was that uh, anyone that have been dealing with exhibition know how wasteful that activity could be. You know. The more beautiful exhibition is, the more ways we will more money generate. So I like the idea that if you're going to do an exhibition on sustainability, it should not create any waste. It should be its own thing. So I start with the idea that these are almost like containers that they come into its own. And once you open, they're like their own traveling crates. But once you open them, they're like cabinets of curiosity, which is in a way is actually the origin of museums when people like to show off their belongings to other people. So that's how it is. And the idea that it's like a Swiss Army knife that when it closes is one thing, but when you open, it really opens many usage and many things to people. 
So we started to design these, and actually, uh, this exhibition has traveled the world because it's so easy to, to, to get it done. So it started at Grand Rapids uh, uh, in 2007, and then uh, it has traveled to, uh, throughout America, go to Australia, India, Thailand, it's now back in Los Angeles. So the way that we have done these boxes also, just to talk briefly about design, is that each of the boxes represent the elements that I talked about. The earth and water box talk about how the materials and water is used in buildings. So when it opened, it opened like the earth. So it has the, the strata of the earth as well as the flow of the water on the other side. The, the light and air box open like a flower. So you can see how the light comes through. We have the skylight of how the light comes through the buildings. And there's a mirror that talks about how light used in the building. The time, the time box is something that talks about the process of constructions and all of that, including work that deal with a historical context and so forth. And space is all about, uh, you know, we all love space over here, I'm sure. So about how do normal people who are not architects understand that space is, you know, in the end, maybe more important than form, and how space can be designed so that the usage of it is actually important. So this is actually when it was displayed at the Speed Art Museum, when Charles was director over there. We installed that in the old lobby of the 1927 building. And this since then has been uh, traveling uh, many, many locations. Apart from uh, buildings, I also do a lot of art, art installations and galleries. I have done a lot of work at the, the Art Museum of Chicago, which is this building right here. And, um, uh, this is me, uh, some PR moment. So, uh, so uh, this is again uh, when we were just starting the office, maybe two years. And so uh, the, the, the newspaper interviewed me when we got a job as to, you know, with all due respect, why do we need you here? We have a lot of good architects in Chicago. So uh, I said, well, for me, I have the privilege of being an outsider. And I like the idea of looking at things from fresh eyes without having to, to deal with the baggage around it. And at the time, actually, when I started to think about buildings as people, because they were asking, well, what, what, what's your concept for, uh, for the art museum of Chicago? And I said, well, I see the art in Chicago as almost like an, an old grandmother, someone who has lived before me, someone who continues to live beyond me. My job today is just helping for this person to have dignity, to have the sense of physical comfort and accessibility so that she can live on to the future beyond my time. I'm, I'm not going to do anything embarrassing to her. I'm not going to put her in a mini skirt or put her on a facelift because that would be short lived and that would be pathetic tomorrow. And I think uh, uh, the people that interview me for the job like that idea because I think, in a way, I think that's what we all try to do. We all think that it, it ends with us. It doesn't. As you can see from this museum, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things to say. I think we need more drinks on all of this. But anyway, I, I, I think that we need, to, we need to think about our, especially in a, in, a, in a cultural context like a museum, it never ends with you. It will continue until, it does, until the end of time. So anything you do has to be reversible. Anything that you do has to respect the people that come after. And that's something that is very important both for sustainability as well as flexibility. So at, at, in Chicago, I've done many galleries. This is a Japanese gallery. Um, this is a Japanese gallery again. Um, Princeton, I've done around 10 projects around, so I'm just gonna go through. Uh, European decorative arts. And we just actually finished the Greek and Roman gallery, which is really beautiful, and uh, I think. And so we just concluded the work in Chicago last year, so after seven years of working together. And so I'm going to quickly show some house projects, because I think that, and these are not built, but these are the things that you know, happened in the first two years when we started the office, and it stayed with me. And I, I, but anyway, so this is the first house that is called the House of Filme. And the reason why is that because it was sitting on a beautiful piece of land just above uh, Sunset Boulevard and both of the clients are uh, uh, people that work in Hollywood. So I like the idea that it's a house that film made. So at the same time, with a pun, I like the idea that uh, we were working on another project to deal with this kind of rolling of material. So I like the idea that, well, what if we can kind of almost create a film 
and it roll and create a sense of space throughout the house. So that's how we explore it from uh, like a roll of film and started to roll and start to merge with the function of a house and create a kind of a wonderful things. But this is what this is in 2005 to seven. So the client lost all the money uh, in the uh, 2008 downturn. It wasn't built, but. Um, uh, there's an, I have actually a very interesting story about this, is that um, the client, as many of Hollywood people you know, uh, have severe case of ADD. So, uh, and at the same time, the client uh, have a house in Nantucket that they love. So they told us, well, we kind of want something that looks kind of Nantucket style, but we know in Hollywood, so it can be something a little bit more funky. So we've been working on this project for a year and a half without showing them what it looked like on the outside and only the plants and they were very happy and um, so time comes when we have to really get a final permit and there's no there's no way to change because we have to go through so many hearings so uh, my staff were very concerned like we well, have to tell them what it looked like it doesn't look at all like a Nantucket house so and, but after a year and a little bit they trust us enough and so I realized like, that this is the first time that we actually made a video of the project that we have because I felt, okay, my only shot in this is I have to make something that capture the attention, 15 seconds. And, you know, and these people are studio execs in Hollywood, so they're used to seeing trailers and things like that. So, okay, well, I'm going to make a video. And so now I have an intern who's very good at video making. So this is the first video that we have never made. And since then, we've made many videos out in-house. They're not as great as the professional videos, but I think that it's more like a homemade thing. So this one in particular, which we have up on our website and other uh, crazy places. Uh, so it's about a story like a Hitchcock movie that you drive up to the house uh, because of there's a murder. So you know there's a detective in the car driving up and as he drives through the house, he was trying to look for the bodies, but turned out that he became the, 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 the tour guide. So every room he go in, he become the tour guide to show you what the room looked like. And there would be evidences and anything. So at the end of the movie, he would go up to his upper floor and turn out that he was walking in the mall of the house, so forth. So, uh, long story short, the, the client loved the story. Uh, we're not afraid of modern architecture anymore. So I felt very happy that I converted a non-modern person into a modern person, using video and using you know, other uh, tech tactic. Again, another house that wasn't built, um, again, by another Hollywood, for another Hollywood client, is uh, on a beautiful piece of land on Mohan Drive. And the land is so beautiful, the client is insanely difficult to work with. So I stick with him for a year until we had to resign because we just can't deal with him anymore. So uh, it's, but again, I mean, the reason when I look at the site, you know, I really feel that many people, many of you know the Kasamala Pate in Capri by Ribera, the one, the beautiful uh, triangle shaped house. This site calls for that kind of architecture. It has to be timeless, it, can be, it has to be formless. It has to be something to integrate with a piece of land. So I decided to do something that's almost formless in that sense, and then create a sense of space in between that is really indoor-outdoor. In, in Los Angeles, we talk a lot about the indoor-outdoor, as you know, people love indoor-outdoor. And so, you know, I was thinking, how, do, how can we do indoor-outdoor in a new way? Not like the case of the houses. So I was looking at, uh, surprisingly, Barco, because I like the idea, you know, we were just talking about this in the office and we said, well, you know, what's it the maximum interaction between indoor and outdoor? And so, well, maybe the barcode, because barcodes actually have the, interac the, the maximum interaction between black and white. So we started to do almost like a barcode space to create these so that, and then started to develop the plan of the house in different solid and void volumes. So you can see, so we started to kind of determine some of the spaces will be in the blocks, like bathrooms and stairs and storage and fireplace will be in this kind of block things. And the open spaces, living room, dining room, office, bedroom will be in a glass box and start to stack them to create an indoor-outdoor kind of house, which is from the top of the house. Oh, I thought I had a remnant. Oh, yeah, this is one. So this is kind of under the house, you can see. So these are the boxes I mentioned about which house all these functions, and then the glass space is in between. For example, you're looking from, a, from an office towards the dining room and the living room beyond, 
under a big roof and water under I'm, I'm a big fan of water under ceiling because I feel like it just blur uh, the boundary of the indoor outdoors so we use it for this house and then many other things too so again it wasn't built uh, because we resigned from the job uh, uh, this is my own house which I would like briefly uh, I never, haven't shown this because I have a commitment with a magazine so uh, anyway, so this is what it is. So, uh, this is in Venice, California, uh, um, the version of uh, that. This is the inside of the house. You can see how indoor outdoor it is. The pool kind of, kind of go inside the house a little bit. That's my office over there, living, dining, kitchen down here, indoor outdoor aspect over there. And then I'm kind of also use concrete, but in a slightly uh, cabousier, kind of rom chom kind of way. This is another picture from looking out over there. And you know, I think, uh, and because of you know, doing some uh, objects and furniture for the house, because I feel like, why do I go to this other thing region buy something that costs as much as I would do it myself? So I'm going, I'm going to be my own, uh, my own experiment. So I'm going to live in it with every object that I would design. So that kind of start our object investigation. For example, this is a wall of you know, you know styrofoam, which is all of the packages that come for the house. So every materials and all of the utensils and furniture that I bought, or you know, not furniture, but like it, it, most equipment, I save them and just put them into like a storage wall as part of the house. So we start to do more and more of these and like the idea that we should really explore to. So this is, I love this picture, but this is my neighbor, a junkie, kind of dealer kind of guy. <laughs> so this is the ones over there. Anyway, so that's, that's where it is. Um, very quickly, so another museum in Texas that didn't get built yet, uh, about to be, so this is the Tyler Art Museum in Tyler, Texas. This is a project that's quite interesting. It's on a 30 acres of land with a creek running in the middle, and we were competing with other architects, but when of the, uh, we won uh, the competition, uh, no, it's actually all in an interview. And uh, so uh, when I look at the site, and there was a you know, kind of a, a discussion later, they asked what I feel about the site. I feel like, well, I really feel that it related to falling water in some sense, because there's a creek running in the middle of the, of the site, quite beautiful, and this very heavily wooded area. So at the same time, you know, when uh, uh, we were interviewed by the client, the client always keep talking about landmark, like, oh, this museum has to be a landmark. It, has to be a landmark for East Texas and all of that. Being a foreigner, I kind of landmark, how people mark the land. So I start looking at how people mark the land, and we realize that this is kind of a moment where people do that uh, out in Texas and other places. So combined with the fact that we want something that's more vertical, so we don't, we don't have to cut too many trees, and something that has like a beautiful aspect of things. So we create a design that looks like that on the top. And the other interesting thing is Tyler, Texas is actually the, the rose capital of the world. So in a way, it kind of looked like a rose. So with, with the idea that it's kind of the complexity of the rotation. So the museum has four stories. As you can see, you arrive on the second floor, you go out from the second... Uh, yes, so this is, this is actually the entrance on the level. And one of the things which is nice is that it is a function as a way for you to see the site. So if you go from the lower gallery to the top library, you have, a, you have a 360 view of the site itself. And it's also kind of nice because as a small museum in Texas, one day you have two people in the museum, someday you have 200. So for a small museum, even if you have two people in the museum, you feel that everyone is together. So the sense of concentration is quite important in a place like Texas. So there's a section, so, I'm, so again, creating a very creekside, cantilever aspect similar to what Falling Water, the Frank Wright Rice house uh, in, in Barron, uh, Pennsylvania. And this is the view of it from the creek. You can look up, this is the lobby, coffee shop. Uh, so that's the, the uh, I mean, not if there is, uh, auditorium area, gallery, gallery, library, office there. So on the ground floor is also the edge of the classroom, so kids can kind of come out and do art right on uh, the creek itself. This is uh, as your entrance through it. That way, inside it has an atrium that connect all the floors together with the elevator, and you can see that. So the idea that it's kind of a, a verticality that, in a way, is Texas never have because it's so spread out and so horizontal. 
So it was a, a, a great design. We almost get all the money we needed. Not quite yet, but I think hopefully they will do it very soon because they already spent quite some money on the site and on the uh, process of, of the project. Now, uh, a very uh, important neighbors uh, out, uh, just in the south, 100 miles south, and that's the process that uh, I got to know Charles, and really, uh, I have to say that it is a, a collaborate, collaboration in many ways, in a sense that and Charles really bring a sense of what a museum should function at, and really be a very strong client. And I think that strong in a good way, not in an egoistic, you have to do it what I like kind of way, but more like in order for this museum to be successful, these are the things and activities that need to happen in this museum. So I think it was a very uh, helpful and really learning experience for me. And I'm not saying that because he's here, but I think that it was part of the reason why we, I, for me, I'm, 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 I, I'm very pleased with the design and I think it will be a very important project for my, for my, for my work, for my portfolio. So this is the Speed Art Museum in the 1927. Yet again, uh, just like any other American museums, it's built as a temple. And it is a temple that really, at one time, functioned. But now it becomes almost like a fortress of culture. And this is what it is now, even though you know, we try very hard to put images and things like that, it still sits there. It sits uh, just on the edge of the University of Louisville campus, which 7,000 students pass by every day, and no one ever goes to the museum. Um, they know that the museum there is very intimidating. I mean, and it's not unique to, to, to the speed. You can ask any, any American museum that was built in the, in the 1920s and in 30s as Timber Museums. People today do not relate to them anymore. They actually see them almost like courthouses. So because of that, I think uh, this is Mrs. Speed herself. So I said, well, so how do museums grow? So in a way, a lot of museums grow like uh, like a toad. So trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every time. And a lot of museums actually grow like Frankenstein. So like you have a body and you have a new wing by another architect, you have another head by another architect. At the end of the day, the essence and the spirit of the place got lost because there's a lot of egos and ambitions of people from different generations wanting to do what they wanted to do. So you come up with a living Frankenstein that comes come to, to live and haunt your children. So anyway, so I'm kind of thinking about what's the right way to do on the, so I kind of look at acupuncture as kind of the saving thing because I was thinking about, in the case of the speed in particular, because the speed has so much space already. So what's the right way to really rejuvenate the building? It's not just about adding another building to the thing because it just makes everything completely convoluted and confusing. But it's about something, the change that has to happen from within. And I was thinking about acupuncture in the sense that it's also less is more. You, you, you do an intervention at precise locations. You could really solve circulation, fragmentalization, and other things within the museum that, you know, case in point, uh, really uh, create a, a convoluted circulation for visitors, a very difficult thing for the staff to work with them because every generation wanted something different. So clearing the house up from within is something that's quite important to do. So that's how I started. Um, so this is some of the thoughts that we have. It has to be traveled from within. It has to be both hardware and software in the sense that it's not just about the form of the museum, but what kind of applications and software that you can install in the museum so that it can actually relate to, to younger people, to different people of different needs. So we started by analyzing the, the the function of the speed, you can see how fragmented it is. I'm sure that if you take an x-ray of every museum, it will be fragmented because just like a hard disk, uh, you put things where it's most convenient. And then uh, before you know it, your staff is all in five locations, your storage is all in five locations, and it's completely confusing for visitors to go from one to the other. And that's the fate of most museums in general. So we're looking at a way to really kind of put a bunch of points around and inside the museum. Uh, in this case, uh, there's a lot of points outside because uh, the problem with uh, the speed and other museums also is not just internally, but how you interact with visitors, how you interact with the city, how you 
in interact with your neighborhood. So a lot of these is about really creating transparency and visibility and connection to from inside the museum, inside the galleries to the different sides of it. So that's where all the points are, creating spaces and visual connection towards the uh, different part of it. So this is uh, the existing museum. Uh, so we propose a new lobby over here, which will uh, connect back to the old building, have a visibility to the front. It will become the city's living room that really go out towards uh, Third Street, which is one of the main street in Louisville. We go out to the second floor, which is the galleries, and third, which is the change exhibition. We create uh, an indoor-outdoor experience. Uh, this is another on the south side of the building. Uh, so it's not just one little thing, but it's kind of spread out, create another visibility towards the south side, which is the, the beautiful landscape for, for the university, create more space and things like that, and create more access, better access to the lower level of the galleries, like in this case. So not only that you add square footage to it, but you, you make the old spaces become more accessible and easier to use uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good flow. So this again, uh, look at that. This is the picture of the new lobby, which you can see that it's very open into a street. It looked back at the front building and allow people to access the building on an axis, which it should be. Again, looking at the view. So I think that, uh, the sense of togetherness in the museum is important for me because I think that if people want information, they can go home and surf the internet. If they bother to come to a museum, they want inspiration. They want inspiration from art, of course, but they should also get inspiration from other people. You know, I think it's important that people are, can understand the social and urban experience that a museum could provide. And it goes beyond just looking at art. It's about having coffee, it's about looking at bookstores, it's about spending time in a space that you can interact with other people. And I think more and more, as we have cases, people actually always stay at home and surf the internet. A museum will become a station that people look for stimulation. And I think if we don't provide that, we will become obsolete and we will become, again, a mausoleum of all art. That would not be a good thing. So again, connecting back to uh, the, the basement of the old museum so it become part of the new lobby. And uh, the museum also own a parking structure, create this space that everyone pass by. So we turn this into a new plaza that have an indoor-outdoor uh, aspect of things. All of the amenities of the museum, uh, the museum shop, the auditorium, the coffee shop, the classroom, are all decentralized. So you can actually open all these places beyond museum hours, so that if you want to do a concert here or a lecture, you don't have to open the whole museum with 20 guards to do that. You can do that with small uh, chunks of it. So, that, so this again, looking into the piazza between the, the parking garage and the coffee shop and the auditorium and many things. And Charles mentioned briefly, I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit uh, late. So this is, uh, we just opened an exhibition in a gallery called R20, which is one of the best design galleries in the country, in New York, that we call it What's the Matter? And it's the exhibition that talks about looking at uh, many uh, of the collectible design objects and really looking at how artists or artisans from different generations transform material. For example, you can see wood over here, the stone and metal and glass, and how people deal with materials and they cook them in a way that's unique to their own need. So this is the gallery. So we curate, design, and also create uh, limited edition pieces for this show. For example, this is actually some of the pieces we designed for the show. This doesn't look too good. I would maybe show another angle. Anyway, it's actually what looked like a, a fuzzy little jumble of stone is actually a very comfortable chair. Yeah, so, that, so this is actually a land that we designed out of glass, which is based on the Speed Art Museum building. And see? Look, a lot more comfortable and presentable. That, so that's a chair that actually was commissioned by a collector in Louisville uh, to create. And uh, what I propose is that uh, this particular collector spent a lot of time in Michigan that was a, a big part of his, of his family and his personal life. And so I propose that we actually go and pick all this stone together, him and his family. Uh, his wife just passed away, so we like the idea that everyone go and pick this stone together on the beach and I create a shed that house that memory through the stones because the part that he's, he go to is called Harbor Springs in Michigan. 
and they have these beautiful stones that create a sense of the beach that he used to go. Uh, so he can sit at home in Michigan, I'm sorry, in Louisville, but still remember Harvest Spring as part of the memory, but created in a way that it's kind of a little bit exciting. Uh, we also creating another uh, structure for, uh, for him in Louisville as well. Um, two last projects, I promise. So this is another project that uh, we started around, um, what, three years ago? Uh, before the Arab Spring, this is in Cairo. Uh, this is for the Alexandria Library, which is one of the oldest libraries in the world, and which of course is uh, located in Alexandria, Egypt. This is the, the building. I mean, many architects in the group might know that around 20 years ago, there's a big competition that Snow Hetta design won and design, and that, that basically was the start of Snow Hetta as an office. So it was a daring competition that creating this beautiful structure right on the coast of Alexandria, which housed the headquarters of the Alexandria Library in there. What I uh, was uh, selected to do, oh, sorry, why is it darkish? Anyway, so is uh, a building actually in Cairo uh, for the same organization, but it's Ka their Cairo headquarters. So, uh, so by doing that, you know, I think, uh, so they really want me to use stone because this building is all clad in Paswan granite, which is you know, the, the granite that a lot of the, uh, the many beautiful sculptures from Egypt was made of for 5,000 years. It's been using this stone. And it looked like mosaics over here, but when you look at that, that is actually like edge, it's eight inches thick. And each of the pieces are 20 feet, to, 20 feet high. So it was crazy for me to think that I need to use all those stones to clad my building. So when I when you see the, the stone quarry in Aswan and other places around, I mean, they're very proud of that stone in Egypt, if you don't know. Uh, and so they, and I feel like, well, I can't do that because not only that, it's gonna waste a lot of elements and there's still some stone left. I feel like the building that's clad by the stone is actually not as powerful as the quarry is actually from. So what I'd like to do is I want to clad, oh, is it too dark, a little bit too dark? So I want to clad the building uh, from the quarry. So we're actually creating a panel. Let me see if I can get it. Hmm. It's a bit dark. That's, anyway, it's a mystery. So, uh, so, uh, so it's, it's actually, the plan of the building is actually a, 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 like an infinity sign because there's two sides which is isolated and wrapped around with this uh, concrete wall which is actually precast with the debris of stone that was collected from the quarry. So in a way, I like the idea I go in, and um, this might be a little bit better. So I go in and create this uh, uh, kind of loop of materials, very powerful, but it's actually the power of the leftovers, the power of negative, which is the stone that was not selected to build uh, the monument. But creating a monument out of it was, was my thought, and create a sense of creating an infinity in plan but every time uh, there's a break uh, in the infinity loop, and you can break and you go into a different function. For example, this one, you go out to the conference center. The other one, you go into the cafe and things like that. So, sorry, I don't know how this got reversed, but it normally looks sexier than this. So, so these are the coffees above and everything. This is sexy too, I know, but yeah. So this, this is going to the coffee shop. You can see that over there, and this go back. So anyway, so uh, this project was was put on hold. Uh, I was actually there when the Takaria Square uh, incident happened, and uh, it was put on hold. And I just heard back from them uh, last week that it might continue. So fingers crossed. You never know what will happen in Egypt. Anyway, so the last project, which is I uh, kind of go on in the foraging, salvaging uh, thought, is a project that we start as soon as we start the office in LA too, which is a pedestrian bridge crossing the Ella River. And the Ella River is, uh, is actually not a river. It's a kind of a concrete irrigation thing, if you haven't seen it. So this is what it looked on a good day. So, so when, I went, when I first went to the site, I was pretty angry because I, I, I didn't know what Ella River looked like, so I thought it was a river. So I was added full of trash. So I was reacting to it in, in a personal way like, well, I really kind of want people to see what the river, because no one ever goes to Ella River, that's where the poor people live. So, so you know, I want the, the bridge to be made from the river. I want people to know that how they treated the river is coming back to them. 
So I wanted to make the, the bridge out of trash that collected from the river below. So we started to look at that. So th the first idea was that we, we want to, I was inspired again by, by René Recepi, like I want to build this from exactly the material I found on that site, nothing imported. But I mean, this span around 120 feet, so I need steels and things like that, which is a structure. But all of the surfaces and the cladding for the, for, for the bridge is all salvaged from the river below, for example, in the walls and the structure is made from a ram earth concrete clad, which is kind of all the salvage materials. Uh, the, the railing is actually kind of repurposed from shopping cart thing and all of the, the walking surface, including the ceiling, is also repurposed from recycled tires and rubber materials. And all of these, uh, that's a good thing about, about Los Angeles because there's a lot of people already working with recycled materials, so we don't have to really reinvent every little thing out of it. We work with them, for example, there's a company that recycles tire to make pavement, so we uh, work with them to provide them the materials. There's a lot of things that we uh, collaborate with other people. So this is what it looked like. It, it, it linked the community with the community college on the other side, and it also functioned as a viewing platform to look at uh, the mural, which was painted 30, uh, 35 years ago, which is called the Great Wall of Los Angeles uh, that tells the story of LA through the use of water. So uh, this is it. Uh, this is my office. Thank you.